This National Professional Anglers Association video presentation is brought to you by Missouri Secrets Tackle and 241 Inc. Productions. So I put together just a little, I call it a hodgepodge of um, sonar, mapping, and network, and all the new stuff, the uh, high-tech stuff that we've been getting exposed to. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the, you know, they have forward viewing sonar. I mean, think, think about it, we've been using sonar just look below the boat. Now you can look ahead of the boat with the Garmin. Um, you can do that with the uh, Lawrence Spotlight Scan and the Hummingbird 360, where you can see in front of the boat and around you. Some other new sonar that's coming out is Lawrence has just released a Structure Scan 3D, where you can see the side images in 3D. And both Hummingbird and Lawrence have come out where they, I call them side scan mosaics. In other words, you can see the side scan on a map with the, with the side scan mosaics. And then the last thing that everybody's talking about is chirp. But I always like to start with some fun stuff. So we'll give you a little short tip. Everybody. <clears throat> Or not everybody, but I think everybody always asks that question. When you drive over fish and you see them on the sonar, we're thinking, how far are they behind the boat? And you can't tell because it depends on scroll speed and the speed of the boat. And it's really hard to tell, but all you have to do is activate the cursor. That's all you have to do. And, and all the models do this. You know, it's usually the arrow button. Push the arrow button put the cursor on top of the fish, and they come up with a little box down in the left lower corner, and that tells you that it's 108 feet behind the boat. <coughs> so if you stop the boat, put the cursor on it, you know where the fish is. And, it, you know, and, and I would recommend everybody do that a few times because it, it, then you get it in, in kind of in your head when you drive over fish, you got an idea how far they are behind the boat. Here's another tip. You know, this is always the, you know, when you go fishing with Gary Roach, he catches more fish than you, okay? So why is he catching more fish than you? Well, Gary fishes in a tiller, okay? So he's sitting in the back of the boat. The boat isn't moving. So you look at the graph and you see those fish, you'd say, well, maybe those fish are below the boat. Well, they are, but they're only below Gary. Because the if he's using a 200 kilohertz transducer at 17 feet, the coverage of the sonar is about five and a half feet, which is shorter than my arm span. So if the transducer's at the back of the boat, and Gary's two feet this way, and those fish are within two and a half feet, we'll say, of his nose, or I mean of the transducer, you aren't on the fish. That's why you're not catching any fish. When, you, when, you, when somebody stops the boat and they're catching fish, you aren't, you need to go get up and fish beside them. It's that simple. It's, it's, when you see fish, they're right below the transducer. That's why when you use a drop shot, you can't see it unless you drop it right below the transducer. People ask me about drop shot settings. You know, what, how do I set it so that I can see my drop shot? You know, and then you can, drop shot could be vertical rigging with a with a with a, 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 a sinker or a heavy heavy jig. It's the same thing. You're trying to see your bait while you watch fish, and so the most important thing on drop shot setting is your cone size. You have to get the bait directly below the transducer. The second is boat control. If you can't make the boat sit still, you can't do it because as soon as you move, your bait is not going to be underneath that transducer cone. So you have to have really good boat control. If you think you've drifted too far, you reel up your bait and you drop it again right below the transducer. Sensitivity. If you turn the sensitivity up, you will see your jig wider because it picks a signal up, a weaker signal on the edge of the cone. If you turn up the sensitivity, you can, you can see it on the edge of the cone. So you get a wider cone if you turn up the sensitivity, but you really don't, 
You really don't want too wide of a cone because you want to be fishing those fish right below you. And you can use a different frequency. You know, the 83 uh, frequency is a wider cone and you can, you'll see your, your bait better. But I like to use the 200 because I want it, I just, I want to know what's happening, you know, within that little tiny circle right below the transducer. What is it? You know, I'd say most of the uh, people here are walleye fishermen. You're probably 80, you know, 60 to 80 percent of people at this conference are walleye fishermen, and the ones that aren't still fish walleyes because they taste the best. And um, so when we see this, we go, oh man, that sure looks like walleyes. If I saw that, I'd say, that's walleyes. It's not walleyes all the time. Suckers. They look just like walleyes. <laughs> Some lakes don't have a lot of them. They're white suckers. Some of them do. The best thing that I use, I use an aquapew for, is the most important function I use it for <clears throat> is when the fish don't bite. Then I can see if it's the right type of fish. If you catch a walleye and you think it's a walleye in your sonar, you don't need to drop a camera. But if you aren't catching them and you think it's a walleye, instead of trying 50 presentations, uh, it's better to just say, let's go see what it really is. Here's another one. This one fooled me. Okay, so I run both a, well, last year I ran a uh, Lawrence Gen 3 with that new transducer that, uh, from Airmore, it's called a TM-150, and you could pick a frequency, and I picked the frequency of like 145 or 105. And then on my Hummingbird, I had an Onyx, and I ran that on 200, and I had no crosstalk, so I could run both of them side by side and look at, look at them for comparison. So on this, I'm seeing both of this, on both of them, and it's a, I'm thinking, that looks like fish, and I was thinking it could be panfish, you know, close to the bottom. There wasn't a fish down there, all was with weeds. And I have never seen weeds lay over on the lake before. I've seen them lay over on the river. I've never seen them lay over like that. So they were laying on their side, that's why they were separate. Usually when you're on, see weeds, you see the weeds already to the bottom, you know, so they'll be attached to the bottom when you see weeds. And that, that one fooled me completely. So how do you do it? You just, I, I have it set up at my booth. And, um, but this is what I use in the boat is the uh, multi-view. <clears throat> I just have it plugged in. There's no, no screen and uh, I just leave the camera cable. You know, there's never a good spot for the that camera cable. You wrap it up and then it seems like you gotta drop it again. You, and uh, then if you, you know, you, I, but I just leave mine just in a mess right below my seat because I'm gonna use it. Um, and I put a, a video cable to my Lowrance and then I watch it on my Lowrance. If you don't have that, you can do an easy way is that little uh, micro aqua view. It's a little portable one. It doesn't take up much room. And you can just drop the camera down, wrap it up. How about chirp? Everybody's chirping about chirp, okay? Chirp sonar, it's the, it's the, the, the new thing. Right now, Lawrence has just come out with an elite TI, but they have elite chirp, and they chirp to a standard Lawrence transducer. The Lawrence HDS model will, will, the Gen 3 chirps right by itself, the Gen 2 will do it with the sonar hub. And they can use both the um, standard Lawrence or a Airmore transducer. Um, the Hummingbird Onyx, you have to buy a special transducer in a box. It gets really expensive, so very few people are using that with the Onyx. Now, the, the new Hummingbird Helix, uh, the 12, actually chirps and it's affordable. It uses the standard Hummingbird transducer. Raymarine, they chirp both side vision you know, a side, um, side scan, down scan, and 2D sonar. Garmin does the same thing. So they, th those two companies are a little different. They're, they have chirp for regular sonar, but they also chirp their side and their down imaging. And they both use their own chirp transducers that, that they have made. 
So this is what CHIRP stands for, okay? You know, it stands for, it was started with radar, and it stands for compressed high intensity radar pulse. <clears throat> with sonar, it just changed it to uh, radiated pulse. You know what, this means nothing. It doesn't mean anything to me, it probably doesn't mean anything to you, but at least you, now you know why they call it CHIRP. It uh, doesn't, have, doesn't help us understand how it works. But anyway, so regular sonar, it sends sound out. <coughs> and they call it a ping, okay? It sends it as one frequency. We've been doing it for years. It either use 50, 83, or 200. That's pretty much the standard. Vexlar uses 107. But that's pretty much the standard frequency. It's a very short transmitted time. So it's kind of like, it goes like this. It's sound, it's, it was ping, 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 ping. Chirp, when it sends the sound down, sends it at more than one frequency. It doesn't just send it at 200, it sends it at frequencies around the 200. So instead of, you know, just a ping, it's kind of, well, this is, my way of describing it, um, it's kind of like ping. It, it, it's, it's longer with more frequencies. And so it's transmitted longer. You, in order for, a, a, the chirp comes from the unit. It has to be able to process the data differently than regular sonar. So it's got, because it's got to process all those different frequencies coming back, and it also has to transmit all those frequencies to do that, and so you have, that's why you can't do it with, um, like the Gen 2 can't do it. It has to have this box which can process the data. Now the Gen 3 in the Lawrence has, has that, that little box built into it so it can process it. Any transducer can be chirped. But they make chirp transducers. In other words, they make transducers specific for chirp and they're better. So why do we use chirp? Well, here's, what, here's the, what you get from the sales guy. You get better detail in deep water. You can read the, the bottom in deeper water. You get better target separation and you get a cleaner display. My experience in shallow water, which is under 40 feet, is I don't see much of that at all. I see mostly a cleaner display. Now, I'm always open to this. I actually just put a question on one of the forums where there's a bunch of guys that have used a different chirpler saying that it's better. And I said, I would like to see comparisons of the same time as the same thing. And I'm still waiting for the response to show me pictures. You know, you can say chirp is better, but unless you compare it, how do you know? So here's some comparisons. What I did doesn't mean it, you know, I'm just not a believer of <coughs> chirp in shallow water making that much difference. But because I haven't seen it yet. Now, if anybody ever has something that they can show me, I'm all open to seeing difference, but it has to be good comparisons of the same targets, same conditions. Now, here's medium chirp on the Lawrence, okay? So this is using um, that Airmar chirp transducer. So this is, you know, good stuff. It's a chirp transducer and a chirp unit. It's, it gives you a clean, clean, crisp uh, display in 30 feet. Here I'm comparing it, okay? So I had this, um, not, uh, two years ago, I had a whole bunch of crappies that were always available for me for testing, which was really nice, just thick school to crappies. So on the left is medium chirp with that uh, with an Airmar TM150 transducer, and the right it is single frequency on that same transducer, just using single frequency, so it's not chirping. Not much difference. The one on the right that's not chirp actually looks better to me, but it's, they're both basically the same. This is the regular Lorentz transducer on the same school of crappies, okay? No chirp, just regular Transducer, that looks fine to me. This is an elite uh, chirp on high, using high chirp on those same crappies. 
this is those same copies with single frequency. This is Ray Marine with chirp um, on about 200, high chirp on the left. I, I, I included their, their down imaging so you could see what the crappies really look like. If you want target separation, don't think chirp, think down scan, down imaging, down view, down vision. You get way better target separation with down imaging than you do with, with uh, regular sonar. So, and actually the, my favorite is the Ray Marine. <laughs> Uh, you know, is it, is it separate the fish uh, any better? Probably not. It's just a better looking screen. I, I actually, whenever I use that screen, you know, everybody in the boat says, oh, that's really nice. It gives a nice crisp, or, you know, arch. It separates the fish well. And it is true. But is it, is it that much better? No, in my eyes. Now, this is hummingbirds. You know, I had, this isn't a picture I took. This came from uh, an, uh, a new... Helix 12, which is just available, and they're chirping their regular transducer, their 200 frequency transducer, and they're telling you that they're chirping it from 175 to 225. So that's the frequencies that they're using. And this picture is showing you these are fish here swimming up and down. Those are fish swimming. These straight lines here are a brush pile. You notice they don't move, they just stay the same. You know, that's, that's, that it's a brush pile. So he's, he's actually seeing fish in the brush pile, which to me looks good. You know, I didn't take the picture, so I don't know the conditions. But this is um, Hummingbird is the entry into the chirp market. Garmin, I haven't got any images. You know, I really I did a little search on the internet. I couldn't find anything. I'll try to get some more next. I'll try to get some next year uh, because they've just released new chirp transducers for their chirp units, you know, just brand new ones. So we'll have to see what that looks like. Forward, you know, um, scan, you know, the <clears throat> Hummingbird 360. Um, mo most of the use of that has been with the bass guys, and there's just a few bass guys that are using it to target They'll target specific fish. There isn't very many people that do it though. It's just, it hasn't taken off that well. It's a really, um, it just works. Now this is from Johnny Candle, trolling a transition. And, you know, think about it. Now that's a really good use of it. You know, he's trolling the transition of rocks and he wants to be right on the edge because that's where the fish were. And he can see that ahead of him. So that was a good, you know, to me, that's a great use of it. This is um, uh, Lawrence's Structure Scan 3D. This is, um, you know, I mean, it, I, I think it's just starting to sell now. We're not going to, you know, the use of it is, is basically the, um, the factory guys have been doing, just doing testing, getting pictures. This is from uh, uh, one of my pro staff, Mark O'Neill, who does uh, validation for uh, Lawrence, and he had a 3D this fall. What he's saying, you know, it's showing you Instead of just side scan, not showing the depth, it's showing the depth of it. And so you can see it in 3D. The, it shows the fish in different colors. And so these are fish um, that it's showing. I don't know how useful it's gonna be. You know, I'm just showing, because I haven't used it yet. It may be useful, but it may not be. It's like Lawrence's spotlight scan. That's a forward-looking sonar that didn't take off at all. You know, it, it, you put it on a trolley motor and you swing it with your foot. You have to put it on a um, cable drive and you swing it. You know, it, it, I've been in it, looked at it. You can see fish ahead of you, but it really hasn't taken off very much, you know, for catching fish. This is Garmin's uh, new <coughs> thing. They are, uh, they must have really fast processors because they, they're showing you what's ahead of you live, like a radar, just like, uh, just like a radar. So what, what this is is that the depth is, is below the boat is right here, and this is in front of the boat. So it's telling you 
that the depth is sloping upward ahead of you. So you can see that with that. To me, that would be useful at times. And many guys, they've had videos where they, they can actually see a jig dropping and a fish move towards the jig when they're, when they're scanning ahead of them. I don't know how hard it is to interpret yet, you know, because I haven't seen one in the boat. That sounds interesting to me. Um, I, I could think of it like, you know, how many times do you cast a musky lure and you're wondering if you got to follow <laughs> or if there's a fish there, you know? I would, uh, with casting, I would think that, you know, right, with me right away is that if I had to follow, I'd stop the lure right there. But, you know, especially if it was suspending and just let it sit there for a little bit when you have that information. Um, it's always hard for me to stop a lure when I'm casting a suspended lure when I, know, I don't know if there's any fish around. <laughs> you know, it, it, it feels to me that I'm, I should be more productive when I'm, you know, when I'm covering water. Um, mapping choices. This is an um, uh, amazing, um, that's amazing what's happened. You know, it's, it's a lot of new stuff have come out. You know, between the custom maps that you can all create and with the live uh, mapping that you can do right now. So, with a custom map, that means you create the map for a chip to put in your unit. You do it yourself. So, Hummingbird has AutoChart, it's a software program. Lawrence has Insight Genesis, which is a software program in the cloud. In other words, you never touch it. All you do is load your data into it and they make the map for you. And then there's Lorentz Insight Map Creator, which is for the advanced map maker. Instant mapping. Garmin has just come out with Live Draw, where, they, where you could just drive across this room back and forth and have it mapped for yourself. Navionics does it with Sonar Chart Live. They were second to do it, and Hummingbird Auto Chart Live did it first. And they, they, all three of these, they can, they can map this room and have it ready to fish in probably 15 minutes, 20 minutes. How do they do that? All they do is just collect depth data from the transducer. Save it to you. Save it. Save it to a SD card. This is for the you know for creating them um, custom on the computer, and you just save it to a card, load it up to uh, the the software, and make your map. Now, if if you do it with the Hummingbird Auto Chart, you know the map can only be used in Hummingbirds. You have to log the data, import it, create the map. The thing is, you have to create the map, so you have to learn the software yourself. And then it creates a special map for hummingbird units, which is just like all of the Lake Master chips. You can use the, uh, the features like the uh, depth offset, the, you can change the colors on it, you can do all of that on that chip on your custom map that you make. And the data is not shared with anybody. Here's a map I made of Lac La Parle, okay? You know, Lac La Parle, I went to a tournament there this year, I'd never been there before, there is no maps. None. They got a couple circles out there on, on some places where there's islands. And you know, where I fished was all the rock reefs, so what did I do? I just turn on the, my Hummingbird Onyx Live auto chart and go map it. There's my, you know, partial map of the uh, lake. I mean, the lake is much bigger than that, but if you look at that, if you're a fisherman, you could say, well, I want to fish there, I want to fish there, I want to fish there, and those are all good spots. But there is no map other than that. For instance, inside Genesis, you record, you just log the data onto an SD card, and you can upload the SD card, or now they have Wi-Fi, okay? That's what, <laughs> this is advanced electronics, okay? The Gen 3 is Wi-Fi. It can connect to your home Wi-Fi. It automatically just upload that data to Insight Genesis 
for, for a map to be created. And then that program creates a map, and you tell it to download the map to your computer, and it'll only work in the units that you decide to tell it to. You know, you, you give them your serial number of your Lorentz model you want it to work in, so that if you make a map of a specific lake that you don't want anybody to have, and they steal it from you, it won't work in any unit but yours. So it's protected. You can share it or keep it private. In other words, you could say, I don't want anybody to have the data but me. And, or you can share it to the Lorentz social map and it'll help map the entire lake. So what, you know, here's my opinion on that. If I, if there was no map of this room and I mapped it, nobody's getting it. Nobody. You know, people have asked for my maps. You don't, you know, I, I finally have given up some of them, but uh, um, I'm not going to give that up if it's a small fishing spot. Now, if it's if you want to, if I'm driving around the lake, I'll, that's okay to upload that data for a social map because that helps them create the whole map. That's the way I look at it. Um, so here's some samples of that map that a that the, uh, the Insight Genesis can make. So what it did, it makes um, a map with bottom hardness and contours if you want. The color shows you the different types of bottom hardness and the uh, lines tell you the shape of the structure. Because sometimes the bottom hardness isn't the same as the, as the shape of the structure. Sometimes you get bottom hardness you know, off the side, you know, some sides have, have, have more rock. They also have the Lorentz Insight gen, uh, a map creator. This is a program, it's not a program for anybody. You know, it's very complicated and uh, I wouldn't recommend anybody using it unless they're, unless they're skilled with uh, map creating. But it's how, you know, the Dr. Sonar maps that I sell, this is what it's created with. You know, I have a, I have a guy that makes the maps, Warren Parsons, and um, he creates the maps for me. And then he, he runs that program. But there are, I'm not the only one that's making maps. There are other people making maps all around the world, selling them, just for Lorentz, because Lorentz provided that tool. So here's an example, Devil's Lake, okay? <coughs> this is a rock ridge. If you fished Devil's Lake before, you'll know where it is. It's been fished many times, many tournaments have been won on it. It, um, um, it's so full of snags and, and lures that it's, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a lot of lures. But anyway, so this is a, you know, decent map. It's an avionics map. This is the map that Warren created on that program. So what do you want to troll, this or that? And you get zoomed in on it, you can see exactly where you want to troll on that boulder ridge. Because this is where it is. You can make aerial photos specialized. You know, I did this for Otter Tail Lake in Minnesota. These little rock piles are white. There's no mapping of the lake that shows those rock piles, none. And you can drive right to them. And the, those little dots there, if, you, if I zoomed in, they'd be contour lines. I put contour lines on them. But anyway, they have um, the little, all those little white spots were rock piles. Lake Oahe, Peoria Flats, famous fishing spot. Big fish, winds tournaments. It's, it's a shallow flat, so what happens is that, you know, when I go, Oahe goes down, it's out of the water, trees grow on it. The trees are willows, the willows grow fast, and the willows grow up, the water goes up, the willows die, and the fish go into the, the trees. So, all that green stuff that you see on here and along here are the trees. This is the map you could use for trolling if you wanted. If you zoom in, you can see the trees. See the ridges of trees right here? And if you, in Warren created the, a color map of it so you could see the depths and colors too. This is Garmin's live draw, okay? This is the live mapping I'm talking about. You know, this is, I just took this picture 
and that's um, you just do it, you just push a button and start driving around and it collects the map for you and shows you it on the screen. Now, Navionics can do this. All you have to have is something to get the sonar and, and have a phone, a smartphone and you, with a Navionics map and you can do live mapping. So we'll use this, the Vexler Sonar Phone, for example. The Vexler Sonar Phone is a black box with a transducer attached to it. And the transducer, I mean, the box will transmit Wi-Fi of the sonar. And so it's showing at the bottom here. This is a, what Navionics can do. It, it can do a split screen on it. So you get the sonar phone showing the depths on the bottom. And on the top, you can do the live mapping with the Navionics uh, app. You can do it with the Gen 3 Wi-Fi. You can do it with a Gray Marine Dragonfly. So all those three of those, if you had those type of models, you can, you can do live mapping if you want. Uh, Hummingbird Auto Chart, you can do live mapping, of course. You know, you can do it with the Helix, the new ones coming out. They just, they just came out, 9, 10, and 12, and the Onyx do the Auto Chart live mapping. It is, a, you know, I mean, most people don't get live mapping until you do it. Once you do live mapping, you're just done. You know, it's like, it, even the lakes that are mapped, you can make a better map. And if you're a spot fisherman, you know, then live mapping is really for you. If you're a, a troller, it can help you with that too. Side scan mosaics. <clears throat> a little secret that people just aren't using. Okay, both Hummingbird and Lawrence do that. They do, a, um, um, they take the side imaging and overlay it on the map live. Both of them can do that. <clears throat> it's called structure map for Lorentz and mosaics for Hummingbird. So we'll just use an example. I'm using the Lorentz, okay? So we get this, you can see it's on top of the map, okay? You can see the depths over here. So you get this little pile of rocks here. To fish those pile of rocks, you know, I'm zoomed in now, so that those are the same rocks. You look at the bottom, it's 20 feet. How hard is it to fish that? There's really, you know, it doesn't take long to see how many fish are there, but you know, what I do on those little ones, I make the structure map, I park my boat on top of it, I hit spot lock or anchor lock, depending on which motor I'm using. Boat sits on top of it, jig around there for a while, no fish, you're gone, or throw out slip bobbers or whatever. It's, it, it, um, for you to, you know, you could, you could drive over that a bunch of times, place waypoints on it, do it too, but that, that, that mosaic is, is the way to do it. Now here's another one, Lake of the Woods, okay? Lake of the Woods is, <clears throat> has a bunch of rock reefs out there. It has a lot of structure to fish, but we're gonna talk about the rock reefs. They have rock reefs and they, they go into mud at the bottom. And the fish like to sit on the edge of the transition from the rock to the soft bottom. So I just did a mosaic up there on the screen. Now, and you can see by my path, what I did was I was doing that mosaic right here and I turned it off right here. And then I drove over here and I come, I'm coming back here. So you could either use your trolley motor pull bottom bouncers along there, or you control it with crankbaits, but you could stay on that transition much better than any other method using maps or even waypoints. You'd have to have a bunch of waypoints. Huge for that. Networking. I think it's, you know, it's just done now. I think about, if you're going to buy a trolling motor, you're going to match it with the electronics. You know, there's no reason to not, you know, they, if you're buying the uh, electric steer motors, if you buy a Trova or, or an autopilot, you're, you should just buy a Hummingbird with it. If you're going to buy a motor guide, buy a Lawrence with it. You want to network them together. They're just valuable. 
doing it that way. Here's why, okay? You see these fish here? You know what you do? Say this, this is a, a hummingbird, doesn't matter, hummingbird or Lawrence. You put a waypoint on those fish. You tell your GPS to go there when they're, when they're networked together. That near totally mother will take you to those fish and park you on them. While well, you're tying your lures up, getting ready. <laughs> that's, I mean, that's, if you saw three patches of those fish, you could put waypoints in all three, and when you're done fishing one, you'd hit the, go to the next one and go over there. They might not be there if it's a flat, if it's a flat, you know, fish don't stay, but if it was tips of structure, you know, they may stay there. So it's a, it's a, it's a good tool. You know, the Motor Guide X5, I've been using that this year, it really works good. It is, you know, everybody wants, I get asked, what is better? You know, they both are, have advantages. The Motor Guide has a better anchor lock or spot lock, okay? It doesn't move as much. The handheld control sucks compared to the Minn Kota. The Minn Kota's handheld control is really good. You can see if the prop is on. You can see what speed you're going, so you know what speed it is you're going. You have none of that information for the motor guide on that. But when you network them together, you can get that information off the Lorant screen. I haven't seen how valuable it is. I know how valuable it is in my hand, because I walk around with it in my hand. And it, it's, uh, it's so I, when I'm using my Minn Kota, I'm wishing I had the anchor lock. And when I'm using my motor guard, I'm wishing I had the, the Minn Kota handheld. I have a nice little <coughs> bolt control tip for the guys that have motor guide. Anybody have the motor guide XI-5? Okay. When you're using it for vertical fishing, or, or just slowly working some structure, I mean, you gotta be doing, uh, you know, it's a little windy out, you gotta be pressing up and down, on the, and you can't see what the prop speed is, you can't remember how many times you pressed it um, and turning. What I do is, is I, um, I put it on anchor lock and if I want to go that way, I just, <clears throat> I hit the button three times for 15 feet and it doesn't just jump and go there. It goes really slow. And when I, if I'm going that way and they say, you know, I think I want to turn left, you know, which we do, we change our mind. I just hit the left one then twice. And if you do that, you can actually get it at a 45 degree angle. And it's, it works way better than you can imagine. If it, it just, it's just really much better than trying to control it with the throttle and the arrow and steer it. I did it with my pontoon this year and I was like, this is amazing. Nobody has boat control like this. So, so that's the end of this quick talk today, you know. If you want more education, you know, um, my, my Facebook Dr. Sonar page talks about sonar a lot. And, you know, sonar is, is the, probably the most important thing with what we use in marine electronics. And I'm just starting to do some what if, what is it contests, which are really educational. What I'm doing is like a little bit of what I showed you here today. I'll show you things that, that, um, that fool us, and you have to guess what they are. And then the winners get an awkward review because we use the AquaView to show you what it really is. Because I could talk about this stuff for probably a whole week, at least. There's just so much on marine electronics. So anyway, thanks for coming, and I hope you guys all enjoyed the conference. It looks like it's going to be a good one. <laughs>